Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Mark Danner, who's a professor at the University of California at Berkeley and at Bard College. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books, former staff writer at The New Yorker, and he also writes frequently for The New York Times Magazine, among other publications. Mark, welcome back to our show. Thank you, Harry. Good to be here. Truth and power, that's something you've worried about for many years uh, in, in your 25 plus years of writing about foreign policy. Uh, you just wrote two articles, published two articles in the New York Review on uh, the Red Cross report on torture, which seems to have turned the debate about torture in a way, somehow it, it's come out from the underground. Now, What's very clear is there were articles here and there by other people beginning very early, including yourself. We think of Dana Priest, Jane Mayer, uh, yourself, uh, uh, Philippe Sands. Why wasn't there a reaction earlier? Well, as you say, Harry, this has been covered uh, rather extensively. Um, uh, the Washington Post had a front page story by Dana Priest and Barton Gelman on stress and duress techniques in December 2002. Uh, so that's nearly seven years ago. Um, I published a book in October 2004 called Torture and Truth, uh, four-fifths of which was government documents, um, basically uh, assessing what was torture and what wasn't, giving permission for techniques that we now certainly call torture. So this has been a story uh, very much in the public realm, uh, I would say for five years at least. and. Um, as to why the Red Cross report uh, had such impact and why it led to these other stories, I think there's a combination of things. One is that the political atmosphere changed. You have a democratic uh, administration in power, one that has uh, denounced in the person of the president himself on his first full day in office, uh, torture as a tool of interrogation, uh, who has renounced the so-called black sites, the secret prisons where uh, prisoners were tortured, who has declared his willingness to close Guantanamo. Uh, so there is a situation where uh, the president has already called this torture, essentially, uh, and said the U.S. government shouldn't be taking part in it. Then you have a report, the report that I uh, made public and wrote about in the New York Review of Books, uh, which gives you the first-person accounts for the mm -hmm. first time of what was done in the black sites. First person accounts of waterboarding, uh, of forced standing, uh, of sleep deprivation. And these accounts are grisly. They're chilling. They're shocking. Um, and they come with the imprimatur of the Red Cross, uh, which is the body legally constituted um, by international law to uh, examine prisoners of war camps, to interview prisoners of war, and to pronounce on the legality of their treatment. And the Red Cross says uh, unequivocally that the uh, treatment that they are describing in the Red Cross report constitutes torture. That's a quote. And that it constitutes cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Another quote. So you have these things coming together. The government itself finally renouncing torture, uh, a clear first person and authentic account of the torture that was done. And finally, the international body uh, constituted to pronounce on whether or not this is torture, saying indeed that this stuff constituted torture. All these th three things together, I think, um, made this a very large story. Uh, the fact is, though, there's a factor I'm leaving off, and that is we're uh, now, as we speak, um, eight years, nearly eight years after 9-11, which is certainly another factor, because in the days after 9-11, uh, there was a considerable willingness uh, to do this. And, um, you know, I remember an article in Newsweek titled Time to Think About Torture. This is by a liberal writer, Jonathan Alter. And this was the attitude around that time. And I think as we get farther away from that time and farther away from the notion that we could be attacked at any moment, uh, attitudes slowly, very slowly change. So that's another factor. And, and it, uh, we should say that your, your article appears to have been influential 
in sort of turning the administration to actually release the torture memos, namely the memos written by uh, people at the Office of Legal Counsel and Justice Department, John Yu here, uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Judge uh, Biz Bibby. J. J. Bybee. J. Mm -hmm. Bybee, uh, uh, which actually added another dimension to the shock. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, the administration has stated unequivocally and through several sources, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, David Axelrod mm -hmm. and others, that the president had looked at the New York Review uh, pieces and decided since this stuff was already in the public realm that he would then go ahead and release the Department of Justice memoranda that you're, that you're referring to. I don't know that there is a cause and effect like that, but this is what the administration has said, and it's in their interest to say it simply because they've been criticized for making these things public, and supposedly, at least criticism from some Republicans, accuses them of making things easier for the enemy by exposing these techniques. The administration's response is, well, it was already in the public realm, so uh, in the New York Review, uh, so what, what can you do? Um, I think, though, that the, the documents that they released are extremely important. These are mm -hmm. Department of Justice memoranda written by, as you say, John Yu, who's a professor at Berkeley, now on leave, and uh, uh, now Judge Jay Bybee, who sits on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, out here. He's based in Las Vegas, but it's the courts in, in technically in San Francisco. Um, and these memoranda are remarkable. They're essentially the legal equivalents of the, the Red Cross documents. That is, uh, where the Red Cross documents give you clear accounts of what was done, of what waterboarding was done, of forced standing, of sleep deprivation, in very brutal detail. Uh, the Justice Department documents give you the legal rationale why this stuff isn't torture. And they're really, I think, important documents in the history of bureaucratic horrors, mm -hmm. basically. And I would urge you know, viewers to read them, as I urge them to read the, the Red Cross Report, which is at the New York Review of Books website. Um, because confronting this stuff in black and white, I think, is very important. Um, it gives a sense of the lengths to which the government was prepared to go to essentially say that black and white wasn't black and white, that you know, this stuff wasn't torture, and here's why. And I think the reasoning isn't very convincing, uh, but um, it should interest every American what their government was prepared to do to say that this stuff was legal. And I think it's important it's in the public realm. Now, now as we examine this, this situation uh, as the information creeped out over the years and, you know, came to the surface, but then there were no consequences. Uh, when we try to understand that, there, there, there was a, there's a famous quote from Ron Suskind's book in which he's interviewing Carl uh, uh, Rove, and Rove tells him, hey, we've got the power, we're empire, we create the realities, and you are just the scribes. Uh, right. taking down what we've done, and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, I should say that that quotation is from the, from the New York Times Magazine uh, in a piece that, that Ron Suskind did in covering the 2004 campaign. And it isn't attributed to Rove, although most people uh, assume, uh, and there's good evidence to suggest it was Karl Rove. Uh, and he indeed said that, you know, we're an empire now, what we do creates reality, you can watch what we've done, you can take it down and, analyze it, and analyze it as is your want, but by the time you do that, uh, we'll already have created a new reality. Um, and uh, it's a famous quotation because it, I think, encapsulates uh, the, the attitude of the Bush administration, mm -hmm. uh, not only toward power, but toward truth. That is, that power, in essence, trumps truth. That we can, because we're all powerful, because we're a unipolar nation, uh, we're at a unipolar moment, excuse me. That is, that there's one great power in the world and we can uh, change everything. Uh, we can even change the truth. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure who else but Rove believed this, but there certainly was a sense uh, that if you were willing to say, you know, this stuff, even though it looks like torture, isn't torture, that you could get away with that. And, and of course, there's evidence, I hate to say this, that in some sense they were right. I mean, it is true that certainly by, you know, as I mentioned, you had a lot of publicity about, you, you had articles about this as far back as 2002 in the Washington Post, front page. But uh, after Abu Ghraib, after the photographs from Abu Ghraib were made public in the spring of 2004, there was an enormous amount of leaking of documents. 
And it's really true to say, I think, that uh, by the end of the summer of 2004, the basic narrative of the decision to use these techniques uh, was already in the public realm. And I was writing about it. Jane Mayer, as you, as you said, was writing about the Washington Post, uh, New York Times, were following it very uh, uh, extensively. Uh, television was not particularly interested. Television news, from where most Americans get their news, by the way, uh, did not follow it extensively, with the single exception of Brian Ross, I think, at ABC. Um, but this was an ongoing story, and one, I've written about this before, the notion of frozen scandal. That is, that you have things that have happened, they should, you would think, since you have the revelation of wrongdoing, mm -hmm. lead to an investigation, uh, not simply by the press, but by government uh, congressional committees or uh, the judiciary. That should lead somehow to expiation and punishment. There's, there's this cycle that we saw in Watergate and, and uh, other scandals that you would expect to, to be followed. And with torture, this did not happen. In fact, it still hasn't happened, it should be said. Um, we still haven't gotten to the point of a true investigation, a societally um, acknowledged investigation made not by the press but by parts of the government or the judiciary. Uh, the judiciary obviously is part of the government. Um, and, and then leading to punishment and, and um, uh, getting rid of this crime still hasn't happened. As we sit here speaking about it, uh, there are still great debates going on what to do about this. Some people are pushing for a commission, others pushing for prosecutions. And as we sit here, not, neither of those things are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, if we need to look for a reference to help guide us in, under, in understanding the, 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 the cliff that we, we've sort of, we might have gone off at some point, although we seem to be pulling back. So it's mm -hmm. Orwell, I guess, and, and his notions of, uh, of a mindset that sets in in this uh, nightmarish world of 1984. Well, I think it's a fascinating point. Uh, of course, Orwell's been referred to frequently during the years of the Bush administration. You know, there's a quotation from him that I particularly like that has to do with the idea of endless war and the notion of a war that, that, that war basically is very helpful because it accrues power to the state. And, you know, the, the perfect war is a war that uh, uh, doesn't kill lots of people, doesn't destroy a lot of things, but is still a state of war. Uh, and he compared it to certain... Uh, uh, you know, elks that smash one another uh, in fighting, but they have horns that won't let them kill one another. So they can have a fight going on all the time, benefit of the fight, but not actually the death that accrues. And the war on terror, although people obviously are killed uh, during it, no question about it, it has to some degree the attributes of this. There's an accrual of state power. There's the notion that we're in a state of emergency all the time. There's the notion, and I think this is critical, that it's unbounded. In, in time and in space. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long it will last. There's no, as President Bush often said, there'll be no you know, uh, surrender ceremony on the deck of the Iowa, as, which ended World War II. Um, and it's unbounded in space as well. It could be going on anywhere. We're fighting everyone, terrorism we're fighting. Uh, so I think where Orwell really comes in vividly is the notion of this endless, unbounded war, the war on terror, which makes the government all powerful, makes the president all powerful, uh, essentially allows him to break laws because it's the unitary executive, he can do whatever he wants. And I think that does very much harken back to Orwell. Uh, I'm curious, as a writer, and a, a gifted writer who, who, mm -hmm. whose uh, exposés and explanations, uh, you know, just are, uh, have no match in my personal opinion, uh, how do you deal with the frustrations that you must experience as you see this trajectory, you, you gather the information, you obviously work hard at the text, and, and there, there's no response, you know, over this whole interval, now we're, we're seeing it you know, turning. Talk a little about that, that, that th this particular material and, and your mission as a, as a writer and your vocation. Well, I think that, um, first of all, thank you for the compliment. Um, uh, I appreciate that. But I think that, um, I think that you have to focus on the story you're trying to tell. Uh, and um, I think if you think that your, your, your mission, as you call it, as you just called it, is to uh, immediately change attitudes or change policy, 
uh, then you're lost. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, yeah. I, I think you have to, you know, realize, as I always have done, that that what you're doing is trying to tell a story, and and in the case of the story like torture, you're trying to make things public, and that 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 is what you're doing, and um, you have to try to be tenacious about it and and keep telling that story. And in my case, the fact that this has gone on and hasn't had the kind of trajectory we might be. Uh, used to in some other stories, it, to me has uh, in turn become fodder, as it were, for reflection and for writing. Mm. And I, I've done a number of pieces, one of them on Frozen Scandal and a number of things in the New York Review of uh, essays uh, on this subject, on the fact that uh, we seem to be stuck uh, where at, at revelation. We can't go on to the next stage, and why is this so? And you know, it's interesting when you look back over over uh, what you've done in, in your life. I mean, I look back, I did a, my first book was called The Massacre at El Masote. Mm -hmm. It was about a, uh, a massacre in, in the Salvadoran mountains during the, the Salvadoran Civil War. About a thousand people died. And um, it, the, what was fascinating about that story is that six weeks after it happened, two, three journalists, Ray Bonner, Alma Guillermo Prieto, and Susan Micellis, all of them reached the site of this massacre and reported on it. And Susan, the great photojournalist, took photographs of it. And these were published uh, in, uh, on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post six weeks after it happened. And uh, government officials, including Salvadoran government officials, but also U.S. government officials, denied that it had happened very prominently. And the story, in essence, sunk back beneath the mm. waves. And um, you know, my book was about the exhumation of, of the graves and, and the fact that it had been definitively proved that this indeed happened. But it was a story that taught me uh, very definitively mm. that uh, many times y you think it's information, but it's not information, it's politics. And you know, mm. journalists, by definition, they think, well, it's information. Information is what makes the difference. And it, makes, it can make the difference, but it's very often not sufficient uh, to make you know, the, the difference. It can make a difference, I should say, but it's oftentimes not sufficient to make the difference. And this is certainly a case where that's the case. And we've lived with, you know, you get into a secondary subject here, which is what is living with the knowledge that the, the government has done this due to the society over time. Um, a Pew poll came out last week that essentially said only 25% of those surveyed, this is, this is uh, you know, late, halfway through the first year of the Obama administration, uh, only 25% of those surveyed were willing to say that the government should never torture. Mm -hmm. And basically about half said it, it should often or sometimes. So, you know, uh, the societal opinions on this uh, tilt the other in the other direction, and the politics has followed that. And it's it's one of the things to remember when I always think of it when I hear people saying, you know, President, former President Bush and former Vice President Cheney should be taken to jail right now, and they've broken the law. And I want to say, well, you're you're right. Why aren't they in jail? Mm -hmm. That's the subject. You know, that's the question. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little now about interrogation and the the turn. Uh, to torture, because uh, your your article, your recent articles in the New York Review, really it, puts down through the Red Cross report the voices of the people who were actually uh, tortured, and and one gets the sense in in looking at other sources that there's a dynamic here that's going on, and so in, in the first instance, uh, there are ways to get intelligence. There uh, and and the the FBI seems to have uh, mastered this art to a certain extent. Uh, talk a little about that because torture emerges out of an apparent frustration with doing what you have to do to get information out of people by not torturing them. Well, I think there's a, a, a one should say first of all that there are parts of this story still to come out. Um, we've heard a great deal about the rivalry between the CIA and the FBI, particularly when it came to the interrogation of the first high-value detainee captured after 9-11, and this is Abu Zubaydah, who was captured in, uh, in Pakistan in Mar at the end of March 2002. Uh, the, the story, as it's come down to us or come out, 
is the FBI interrogated him for several weeks. Uh, FBI people claim that they got a lot of good information. Uh, th there was eventually pressure from the CIA, some CIA people and some people in the administration in Washington to use tougher techniques. There was a great deal of argument back and forth. Eventually the FBI pulled out. They said, we're not going to be associated with this. The CIA went to these tougher techniques, which included waterboarding uh, and long-term sitting. They shackled him to a chair. Uh, played loud music at him, shined bright lights in his eyes 24 hours a day for weeks. Uh, so sleep deprivation, food depri deprivation, uh, stress positions, waterboarding, etc. Bouncing against a wall with they a collar. They smashed him, exactly. They smashed him against the wa a wall uh, using, a, first of all, a towel around his neck, later a collar, a specially made collar around his neck. Uh, they pressed him into a very small box, um, uh, specially made, apparently a coffin-like, tiny coffin-like box, and other things that are detailed in, in the Red Cross report. But you're quite right. Uh, there was a great deal of discussion about what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there was clearly f pressure, some pressure from above. I'm talking about not just above in the CIA, but above in the administration itself, that other things had to be used. Um, we, we don't know, we know a lot about this story, but it should be underlined mostly through leaks. Uh, which is to say unnamed government officials who talk to journalists. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't trust them. It does mean that the degree of credibility is not as high as one would like it. One would like to actually see people testifying under their own names uh, and against one another, basically, and to have a full account of what happened. But what we know so far is there's a great deal of controversy. The FBI claims and continues to claim mm -hmm. uh, that uh, these things aren't necessary, that you can get, in, in fact, they're counterproductive, and you can get much better information using traditional techniques, and furthermore, that they did get better information. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we, don't, we can't definitively prove that simply because we don't know the whole story, but there's certainly a lot of evidence suggesting that is the case, first. And second, there's an awful lot of evidence suggesting that the reversion to torture is enormously damaging. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's damaging to the reputation of the country, uh, which is not a small thing. I mean, this the so-called war on terror is a political war, a war basically that is about, at the end of the day, persuading young Muslims not to join these organizations and take violent action against the United States mm -hmm. and its allies. So this is a war about persuasion. It's not a war that will be won by killing the most people. So the political aspect of this is extremely important. Uh, it's primary, as a matter of fact, as it is in counterinsurgencies. The war on terror is essentially a worldwide uh, counterinsurgency. Uh, so that's one detrimental aspect. A second detrimental aspect is it, it you know, deprives you of expertise, in this case the FBI. Uh, it's controversial within the bureaucracy, you get a great deal of leaks. Finally, and I think perhaps most important, uh, it destroys justice. You know, basically you torture people, you can't try them. Mm -hmm. You can't prosecute them in a legitimate tribunal. So you create this group of people, as we have now created, who are in permanent detention without having been tried in any kind of legitimate court. And, you know, many of these people, like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, almost certainly have a lot of blood on their hands. Uh, they should be prosecuted and punished. Mm -hmm. And we've, the United States has put itself in a position where it can't legitimately do that. That's, that is, it can't legitimately hand down justice in a way that will be recognized uh, by the rest of the world. So all those are very detrimental things. And on the positive side, you have, you know, on the other side, you have people, most prominently the former vice president, uh, Dick Cheney, saying that, you know, this stuff was necessary to protect the country. Uh, we prevented attacks. And if, and, and furthermore, and this is a very important point, he argues that President Obama, by renouncing these mm -hmm. techniques, has made the country vulnerable. So this is very much part of uh, contemporary politics because uh, he's essentially laying down a kind of predicate saying if there's another attack it'll be Obama's fault because he didn't torture. So this is one reason I think it's extremely important to go into this stuff, investigate it, investigate these claims that you know this protected the country and you know the, the difficult part about that is that is in the president himself, President Obama has said this, the thing you have to determine is not whether they got information through torture. They clearly did. I mean, they clearly did. They had these people for mm -hmm. years. Uh, you know, they were interrogating them. They clearly got information. The question is whether they got any information that they couldn't have gotten through other means. And I think that's a very open question. And a lot of experts, including FBI people with very strong experience and CIA people, 
believe that they didn't get anything they couldn't have gotten through other means. And if that's the case, you know, I mean, I think the, the case as it stands now is very clear that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, I think the, the, the burden of proof lies on the other side, and they haven't come close come close to satisfying it. In fact, the major part of their case really is secrecy. It's saying it prevented all these attacks. Which ones? Well, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still secret, which the, the vice president says very prominently. Um, so I think the fight on this continues, but it's a political fight. Right. And, and let, uh, I, I think that, that if we probe into this interrogation turning into torture, we see how all of this comes together because it, there is some evidence and maybe enough evidence to indicate that uh, the people who were now torturing were being supervised, both by people on the scene, by people at Langley, and by, possibly by people in the White House. Mm -hmm. Hence, this, this uh, situation of the need for the memos to say, well, this is all legal and so on. Uh, and in, in this scenario, what becomes interesting, and, and here I want to move back to what we were talking about before, which is the uh, 24 ticking bomb culture that we're now living in. Mm -hmm. And the notion being that, well, you've got to get this information right now because a device is going to go off in the next 24 hours and so on. Right. And what, when we put all of this together, what we see is a ticking bomb that's not the ticking bomb we normally think of, but really getting intelligence in, in one particular case uh, to link Al-Qaeda to Saddam Hussein, so we could go to war. Talk a little about that, because it, it it's not just that the ticking bomb scenario is wrong, but in it, it becomes something else, and the th the ticking bomb we think that's the problem is not really the problem. Well, I, th I think you bring up a lot. Of those <laughs> yeah, are several yeah. <laughs> issues you bring up, uh, all of them uh, very good ones and very complicated ones. I, th I think the first thing to be said is that the whole notion of the ticking bomb is something that seems to be uh, built into the psyche of a lot of Americans. Uh, you find it everywhere in popular culture. The most obvious uh, illustration of it is the television program 24, which you mentioned with Jack Bauer. Uh, and until recently, it's now changed, but until recently, it was always the case that the plot turned on you know, an attack that one knew it was going to happen at a certain time, one knew that there, it was this magnitude, et cetera. One knew this particular person who you had uh, in custody knew about it. One had all the information except that last little bit. And uh, which is where is it? Uh, so uh, you know that would lead to torturing this this person, and you'd find out, and at the last minute, be able to save the day. And you know this notion, uh, this kind of dynamic that you need to go beyond the law is is quite. You find it earlier in American culture. Dirty Harry, the movie mm -hmm. with Clint Eastwood, is a great example of it. Very similar plot. And in these plots, the liberals, the people who follow the law, red tape, all of this, that's the enemy. You know, and, and the hero is the person who is willing to uh, go beyond the law and use uh, untrammeled government power to protect the populace. And you see why this is kind of a calming narrative. When people are frightened, I think they like to know or like to think that somewhere somebody is going to protect them and do anything necessary to protect them. So it's a very calming notion. The problem is that when it comes to torture, this doesn't fit what happened. You know, it's, it's interesting. Whenever you have uh, an argument and a debate, and the person you're debating always goes to a hypothetical, when there's actually real instances in front of you, you know that something is wrong <laughs> with the argument. And in fact, if you look at the way torture is used, in so far as we've seen it, the American government using it, uh, it was never a ticking bomb. In fact, they would capture somebody who they thought was significant in Al Qaeda who, if there was an attack that was going to happen, probably would know something about it, and they tortured them. And, uh, and they would get certain information, and which usually had to do with how to find other people in the organization. Uh, and then they would get those other people and torture them. So this is how it generally works. The ticking bomb isn't really an accurate representation of what actually happened. We know what actually happened. Uh, so uh, I agree it's not accurate, but it is deeply instilled for reasons I think that are easy to understand in the American psyche. It's about commitment. It's about the willingness to do anything, to use untrammeled power to keep people safe. Now, the connection which you brought up between Saddam Hussein uh, and 9-11, uh, uh, which uh, Bush administration officials were convinced of, 
I think in some cases sincerely convinced. I think Paul Wolfowitz, for example, really believed that Saddam and the Iraqi intelligence services were in some way connected to 9-11. And it was his hope and the hope of others that the Iraq war could be fought on those grounds. You know, they attacked us. We now have to attack them. Very simple. People can understand it. The problem is they couldn't find evidence for mm -hmm. it. Uh, they had this fellow Mohammed Atta, who people will remember, who supposedly met with Iraqi intelligence in this meeting in Prague, which the CIA unfortunately said never happened. Uh, they had all these bits of information, which unfortunately they couldn't back up. So it seems to have been the case that in some of these interrogations, uh, an effort was made to try to get information from some of the detainees using torture uh, that would back up this plot line that, in fact, 9-11 uh, uh, was really an Iraqi uh, intelligence um, uh, operation. <coughs> they didn't get any evidence like that. And um, it, this clearly entered into the plot. Now, I think that it's an exaggeration to say, as some are now saying, that, in fact, all this torture was about justifying an illegal war. You know, you hear that frequently now. And um, I, I think, so far as I know at this point, that's an exaggeration. They, the administration was clearly very intent on getting information about a possible second attack. They were very concerned about it. One can understand why. So I don't think this was only about Iraq. But Iraq, clearly, from what we now know from the Senate Armed Services Committee report uh, especially, uh, did enter into their concerns. And it was, it was part of what they were trying to get uh, in the way of information. Mm -hmm. it, it, now let, let's turn to the, the leadership here, because uh, we were cursed in a way with a leadership that harkened back to a period uh, uh, many decades ago when uh, we had the Watergate scandal, we then had the Church Committee, mm -hmm. and of course both uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld held key positions in the Ford administration, which took over uh, uh, after uh, Nixon. So, so in a way, and, and you point this out, you say that uh, the, 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 the gloves were off now, which was a repudiation of what these leaders had suffered back in that earlier period. Talk mm -hmm. a little about that, because it's a, it's a key, they're an atavism. It's a key component of their mindset. Absolutely, I think that's an extremely important point, the historical point. And uh, you can begin with the phrase, the gloves were off. The gloves came off, which uh, was a phrase that was current after 9-11. Uh, Kofor Black, uh, a key CIA, then a key CIA counterterrorism official, said it before the Senate. But the phrase was used a lot. You know, after 9-11, the gloves came off. Uh, and of course, the general popular meaning of this was just, well, we're going to do anything. The gloves came off. You know, we'll do anything. But of course, it has a somewhat subtler meaning, because if the gloves came off, that means that before 9-11, mm -hmm. to state the obvious, the gloves were on, uh, which is to say that there's something exculpatory in that. It says, you know, it wasn't just that we ignored intelligence warnings, which of course they did, uh, the administration, I mean. It was that there were certain constrictions on American power, on the president's power, the power of the CIA that uh, inhibited them from doing their job and made it possible for such an attack to succeed, which is to say it wasn't our fault. It was the fault of those who put the gloves on, mm -hmm. the president and the CIA. And if you look at this closely, you really are brought back uh, inexorably to a period after Watergate, as you said, uh, in the mid-70s, uh, when you had the Church Committee hearings, and, and the Pike Committee too, but the Church Committee is the most prominent. Uh, Senator Frank Church from Idaho uh, convened these very high-profile hearings, they were televised, into the CIA uh, covert actions. And it exposed a great deal of wrongdoing, or illegal activity in any event, uh, by the CIA, including attempted assassinations. There was involvement with the Lumumba assassination, for example, uh, although he was killed by others. The CIA had planned to kill him. Uh, attempts against Castro, uh, coups in Guatemala and, and uh, Iran. Uh, many of these things that have become you know, clear parts of history were exposed in 1975. One of the consequences of that was a series of laws were passed that it indeed did the limit, limit the president's power to use the CIA. The most obvious, the one we talk about a lot is FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance mm -hmm. Act, which limits illegal wiretapping, warrantless wiretapping. That was passed in 78 during the Carter administration. But there's an earlier law, more important I think, that essentially requires the president, whenever there's a covert action, to sign a finding 
-hmm. what's called a finding. He has to sign off and say, I have given permission for this to take place. Because before church, you know, the CIA would plan an assassination or a coup, and the president essentially would not have his fingerprints on it. And, and if indeed it became public, the president had what was called deniability. I didn't know about it, I didn't approve it, etc. Well, the Congress attempted after the church committee hearings to basically say, you know what, no more deniability. And, you know, as you point out, during this period, Cheney and Rumsfeld, at, during the last days of Watergate, were high officials in the Nixon and then the Ford administration. Uh, Cheney actually was chief of staff at the age of uh, uh, 34, which is remarkable, very mm -hmm. young man. And Rumsfeld was uh, first chief of staff and then secretary of defense. It, it is similar, I think he was 35. Mm -hmm. So as very young men, they had great power. They saw the, the decline and collapse of the Nixon administration and the Ford administration, and they saw the aftermath, aftermath which was putting the gloves on. So now we fast forward to 9-11, the attacks happen, and one of the things they're concerned about is taking the gloves off, because first of all, defining the attack's success in these terms is, as I say, exculpatory. It says, this wasn't our fault, it wasn't simply that we ignored the president's daily brief in August, on August 6, 2001 that said, Al-Qaeda, determined to attack within the United States. That was the title of it. It wasn't that we ignored that. It was that the CIA has been limited, the president's power has been limited, we have to take the gloves mm -hmm. off. So they proceed to do a number of things. They start to wiretap without warrants. They ignore the FISA law. Uh, they sign a number of findings that gives the CIA power to interrogate and use enhanced techniques. And hence the importance of these memos. That exactly, just, yeah. exactly. So this brings us to the present. The CIA says, fine, we will do these things, but we want ironclad assurances mm -hmm. that when this comes out, because it will, uh, this is legal. And, and so you get the Department of Justice lawyers, John Yu, Jay Bybee, uh, later Stephen Bradbury, writing these memoranda that in these legal contortions say, well, actually this stuff, even though it looks like torture, smells like torture, feels like torture, it's not torture. And these are the memos that are now uh, public. And it's, it's a fascinating thing, I think, that you know, those memos, there's a sense in which they were written to be made public. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, the CIA fought against them being made public. Everybody, there's a big controversy. But in essence, in a funny way, those memos uh, after church were really written uh, for this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. This was the, these were the memos that were going to come out when the scandal happened. And you know, you can think of this as a game of musical chairs, the children's game, in which the CIA said, you know what, when the music stops, we're not going to be the one without a chair. We mm. want the memos. <laughs> we're going to be sitting down. Yeah. Someone else is going to be yeah. without, without a chair. So now you have a situation where not only do you have the memoranda, but the CIA made it clear, and you said this in your question earlier, that not only were these techniques approved at the highest level of the CIA, not only did the interrogators stay in daily contact mm. with Langley and get specific approval for all their techniques, but George Tenet, then the director of Central Intelligence, made his way almost daily over to principals' meetings in the White House. The principals' committee is the highest decision-making body in the country. Vice President, National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Attorney General, mm -hmm. all of these people sat there got briefings about what was going on. So you have, in effect, the entire top of the government implicated in this. And before church, this would have happened at the mid-level. President wouldn't know anything about it, or at least he would say he didn't know anything about it. There would have been no paper, and so on. Now, after church, everybody is explicitly implicated, which brings us back to the problem of what to do about it, you mm -hmm. know? Because if everybody's implicated, do you prosecute president, vice president, secretary of state, secretary of defense? Attorney General? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the answer to that is yes, but it's clear that this is rather difficult. It becomes mm -hmm. rather difficult. But before we get into that, and I want to get into that right away, I, I do want to emphasize one point that, that uh, the, when you bring Cheney and Rumsfeld to the present uh, and, and their team, they have extraordinary ignorance about who the adversary is, who the adversary is in Iraq. So they are under the pressure, and as you said a moment ago, it was on their watch that 9-11 occurred. 3,000 mm -hmm. Americans were killed. So they have the need for more and more information. 
and uh, uh, willing even to use the SEER program, which trained our soldiers uh, how to not make false, context, uh, false confection, confessions during an earlier period of the Cold War. So, mm -hmm. so they want more and more information, right. and so you get this dynamic that that is uh, is creates all these pressures for more and more torture. I, I think it's true that there is this enormous pressure for more and more information. That's absolutely. Uh, true, and I think there's this anxiety, you could call it a psychopolitical factor, mm -hmm. this anxiety that, you know, they're this government that came into power, they had a problem with legitimacy from the beginning. Uh, their guy, George W. Bush, received 540,000 fewer votes than his opponent. The first time that's happened since, since the 1860s uh, or 1870s. So, you know, they had this basic problem. Then they had the fact that they had ignored warnings, and they knew this. Um, and they had this incredible successful attack that killed 3,000 people. So I think one of the, comp one could call it a compens com compensatory action, was to make sure that they did everything they could to stop a second attack, uh, even to breaking the law and torturing. And uh, you're right, you know, this feeling of demand for information, we need to know everything. We have to push to the last, uh, our last effort to know everything, and the law shouldn't stand in the way. Particularly, it shouldn't stand in the way of the president, because the president, in fighting a war, has the ultimate decision on what to do. Laws cannot constrain him. Remember that for John Yoo, for example, uh, and other administration lawyers, they really believed this, that in the national security field, after you are in a war situation, the president can't be constrained mm. from doing pretty much what he wants. Uh, I mean, these people are rather unusual in believing this, it should be said. That isn't mainstream opinion, but they did believe it. Uh, so they pushed, as you say, for all kinds of information. One of the ironies, though, is that you see again and again in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere that this push, this thirst, this demand for information now led to a breakdown of the intelligence procedures that were there to get the information. I mean, they essentially, I saw this personally in Iraq reporting there, that these procedures where they would cordon, the American military would cordon off a neighborhood, go through the houses one by one, uh, and arrest all the young men, mm -hmm. you know? And so you'd have a thousand young men sent to Abu Ghraib. Now, of those thousand, very few knew anything mm -hmm. about the insurgency. Some probably did, very few. But you essentially were sending so many people uh, to Abu Ghraib, to the interrogators, that you flooded the system. And they spent their time, and interrogators told me this, you know, interviewing repeatedly people who didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And the combat units who had, uh, uh, officials, representatives on the boards that decided who was to be released from Abu Ghraib would essentially not let these people be let out because they said, you know, this acknowledges we got the wrong people. So the people would be stuck there, the interrogators would be working overtime trying to get information. You were essentially clogging the system. This happened in Afghanistan too. It also happened, you know, in Afghanistan there were enormous numbers of people sent to Guantanamo who shouldn't have been there. You know, in Guantanamo now, there are 240, uh, 241, I think, uh, detainees. Well, at one time, this was 800. Mm -hmm. Now, none of these people have been prosecuted. They've essentially been sent back to their home countries, most of them to be set free. Uh, so most of these people simply shouldn't have been there to begin with. And um, this has happened throughout. You know, this was one of the bureaucratic expressions of this kind of overwhelming anxiety that you pointed and, and to. And Wilkerson even gives us a name, a kind of a mosaic theory of intelligence. It's yeah. almost like the, the bureaucratization of stupidity and incompetence. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, well, that's a good way to put it. This is, this is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was uh, chief of staff for Secretary of State Colin Powell in the first uh, Bush administration, who, who basically says that because they had so many people who didn't know anything, they developed this theory called the mosaic theory, which is that if you get enough information, even from people who know nothing about the insurgency, you will be able to connect the dots and g gain information about future attacks, essentially. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't sound very plausible in the way I just summarized it, um, and I don't think it is very plausible, but it was a theory that let them think, even if this, these prisoners don't know anything specifically, they will be helpful to us if we interrogate them. The problem is, of course, it led to a great many people uh, being detained who shouldn't have been detained. You know, it was un unjust and led to a great deal of anger and resentment. Uh, political damage of the kind that I've mentioned. Now, uh, one of your important contributions uh, to the, our understanding of all of this is 
to uh, help us understand that this is a political problem and that uh, the American system has a tendency to turn everything in into a legal problem. So let's round up these culprits from mm -hmm. the previous administration. But it's much more difficult than that because a lot that was done touch centers of power across the government. And now we're, we're learning that maybe some Congress people were actually briefed and so on. So you have a very difficult conundrum. And, and you, you list in, in your article, leaders violated the law, they lied to the public. Uh, and then Congress passed a law allowing for military commissions, which included uh, uh, items to essentially exonerate everybody who would mm -hmm. talk. Talk a little about that, because the problem now is what do we do about all of this? And you're saying if we don't address the political dimension of this, then we're not going to be able to move on. I have, a, I have great sympathy uh, for those people, for the argument that, well, the law, you know, people broke the law. Uh, and in essence, this is a simple matter. People broke the law, they should be arrested and prosecuted. Uh, and increasing numbers of people are saying that. Uh, to me, the problem is that it's, and this is obvious, that it has become, it was clear that people were breaking the law. Uh, no later than late 2004, it was clear. Um, it, this was public. Um, it was clear in 2006 when the Democrats uh, took over Congress. Uh, it was clear when Obama took office in January uh, of 2009, and yet nobody has been arrested. And uh, rather than railing about or, or simply c repeatedly making the argument that people have to be arrested, I think it, it uh, is important to try to understand what the forces against this are. And the major force against it, I think, is a political one that uh, I think politicians know that this is a very unpopular issue, uh, that many in the public believe uh, that uh, anything should be done to protect the country, and that if these officials reverted to torture, that's a horrible thing, but they did it in trying to protect the country. Um, a lot of people feel that way. Um, politically, there is a reason why, you know, John Kerry in running for president in the wake of Abu Ghraib never talked about Abu Ghraib. Uh, there is a reason why you don't see political campaigns with people using torture as a major issue in the political campaigns. Politicians, uh, American politicians believe that this is not a winning issue and that it puts them in essence on the side of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, so this is not, uh, this is a complicated issue and there's a reason I think why President Obama is resisting the appointment of some kind of prosecutor. Uh, can't be a special prosecutor, that law elapsed in 1999, but some sort of prosecutor within the Justice Department probably to deal with this, um, because, not least, because it's very unpopular, it's controversial, and it also will sour relations very dramatically uh, with the Republican minority. I mean, there's a political aspect of this that's very uh, powerful. Um, that doesn't mean, I hasten to add, that there shouldn't be prosecutions mm -hmm. at some point, but it, it's, it's my belief uh, that the way to get there lies through some kind of commission, uh, blue ribbon, bipartisan, something like the 9-11 Commission perhaps, perhaps something uh, in Congress but a special select committee like Watergate. There are various ways it could be done. Uh, but the job of such a commission would be to delve into this, even though we know a lot about it, to look at all the evidence, including that classified at a very high level, <clears throat> and tell the clear story of what was done. Uh, not least, putting to rest this notion that this stuff was absolutely necessary to protect the country. I think that um, somebody with an authoritative voice, you know, rec with uh, credibility, um, needs to lead such a commission and essentially tell the public uh, that we've looked into this and that, first of all, it's not true that this was necessary to protect the country. It was a terrible mistake, et cetera. And I think that may well lead to prosecutions. Uh, there's a critical problem here, of course, which is who do you prosecute? Um, this was a decision made by all evidence by George W. Bush. Uh, it was a decision uh, monitored and impl implemented by all evidence by Richard B. Cheney, the former vice president. Uh, it was known about by the attorney general, by the secretary of state, Colin Powell, by the secretary of defense. 
uh, Donald Rumsfeld. I mean, the highest officials in the country uh, knew about this and watched it happen. I mean, does that mean they shouldn't be prosecuted? No, it doesn't. Uh, does it mean that this is not a simple problem? Yes, it does. Uh, it is a, a hard question, um, uh, it, and it has never happened before, that an American government has come to power and then prosecuted the highest officials of the former government. Um, maybe this needs to happen in this case, but I honestly do not believe that pushing for such prosecutions in the very near term serves much purpose. I mean, it may serve the purpose of pressuring uh, the government to come up with some other solution, um, but many people seem to believe that uh, such prosecutions can happen immediately. I simply don't think they can. Um, you know, you mentioned the Military Commission Act. This was a law passed in the fall of 2006. Um, among its provisions is one that purports to shelter any, all these interrogators from prosecution under the War Crimes Act of 1996. Now, this was passed in the fall of, you know, 2006, you know, a couple, of three, less than three years ago, and the Democrats were in the position where they could have filibustered it. They could have stopped it if they'd wanted to. Now, they decided not to. Why? Because they didn't want to be put in the position, this gets back to the political dynamic, of being accused of coddling terrorists, which they knew the president would indeed do. That's what he would say if they blocked the law. They stood aside, they let it pass, and then they took over Congress. They won Congress in November 2006. Now, that little story should tell you something. Not only that the Democrats are craven and power hungry, if you want to conclude that, <laughs> but it should tell you that their estimation of the political reality had some accuracy to it. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, at this point in the conversation, usually people say, well, this is politi political expediency. You have to stand up for the law. And I do stand up for the law. I just think, you know, I've been writing about this for five or six years, as have many other people. And, um, y you know, it's clear to me that this isn't a simple matter of, of, uh, of leading George W. Bush and Dick Cheney off in handcuffs, uh, much as some people may fervently want to do that. Um, it's more complicated than that. And I think at the end of the day, the thing that you need to destroy uh, is torture, is the idea of torture mm -hmm. as, as a solution to a problem. You have to destroy torture before you destroy the people who did it. And, uh, you know, the, the real thing that the country needs is the destruction of the idea of torture. And, and more importantly, the idea that, in essence, which is really what Cheney is saying, that the country cannot defend itself while still mm -hmm. adhering to its laws. That if, it, if the United States follows its laws, it will leave itself vulnerable. That the only way it can be safe mm -hmm. is to break its laws. The only way it can be safe is to torture people. Uh, I think that's a pernicious, terrible idea. Mm -hmm. It's terrible that the former vice president is saying it, and it deserves to be destroyed. Because if it isn't destroyed, after the next attack, you will have people saying, because they're saying it already, mm -hmm. not just Vice President Cheney, uh, that, well, you know, we wouldn't have been attacked if we hadn't stopped torturing people. And that is a horrible thing to be said in the United States, and it shouldn't be said. And the only way to get rid of it and to make sure it isn't said is to investigate what happened and show conclusively that the events of the last seven years or eight years do not prove that, that they prove the opposite. And, 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 what, and you're somebody who reflects on foreign policy, the trajectory of our foreign policy, uh, especially since uh, the end of the Cold War and, and even before. And what, what you're, I believe you're saying there is a, dem, a moral dimension to this, you know, in the sense that under the cover of darkness, these people uh, in, a, in, in, in their frantic, mistaken efforts to defend us, uh, not that we didn't need to be defended, but that that they essentially felt it was necessary to change who we are, basically, and that that it, it it's a it, it's a it's a small step that they took, but it's also I mean there were only a handful who were tortured, but but it has very great implications for who we are. I think that's uh, very eloquently stated. I think you're. Absolutely right. I believe uh, very strongly in what you just said, that, that uh, these decisions uh, are, have a, a dark foreboding uh, for what the United States is. 
And, you know, there is a tendency in times of war, and you see this tendency on the part of a lot of people, and I mentioned that it's prevalent in popular culture as well, to say, you know, we have to be willing to do everything. You know, these laws can't be allowed to uh, leave the United States vulnerable. Um, and it, it really comes down to an argument saying, uh, it's not that we don't torture, it's that we only torture when we need to. And I don't think um, that is actually a true statement about the United States. I think, you know, it is wrong to say the United States has never tortured in its history. It has. I think it is true to say it's never been official policy before. Uh, and I think that's a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this country has a, a very uh, proud history of not only adhering to human rights and the laws of war, but creating those laws of war. This goes back to the Battle of Trenton and George Washington and his insistence that prisoners not be tortured, even though the other side was doing it. A very famous incident uh, that soldiers know, by the way. It goes back to the Lieber Code, which was introduced uh, under President Lincoln during the Civil War, uh, and which is a key part in the history of the laws of war. Uh, it goes back to the Hague Conventions, the Geneva Conventions. You can name all of this. And the United States has been a leader in this uh, from the beginning. Now, does it mean the U.S. hasn't committed uh, crimes on occasion? Of course it doesn't mean that. It, the United States has. But it has never taken the point of view or the position officially that torture is necessary to defend the country. Uh, and I think this is a horrible, horrible thing. And it is, as you say, a moral uh, uh, a critical moral issue facing the country, I think. Uh, it goes to the question of who we are and whether, you know, Americans tend to define themselves through what's called American exceptionalism, that this country is a shining city on the hill, as Reagan uh, said, uh, quoted, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a, one doesn't have to go that far uh, to believe strongly that the United States adheres to international law. And, um, you know, some uh, listening to this will say, well, this is ridiculous, it's an imperialist power, it does what it wants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I understand those arguments. Uh, I still think, though, uh, it's extremely important when you get to issues of, of uh, the laws of war and other things uh, that you not have an explicit position on the part of the United States uh, that it needs to torture to defend itself. I think it's not true. Uh, I think this sh idea should be expunged. It's important to say that uh, President Obama has gone some way in this direction. His first full day in office, he issued executive orders uh, ending the, the use of these techniques, saying that all CIA interrogators had to adhere to uh, those techniques included in uh, the military field manual, first of all, Army field manual. Uh, secondly, he closed the black sites, uh, and thirdly, he said he was going to close Guantanamo, and will do so within a year. So he's gone a far way down that road. The problem is that, that those, in a sense, were the easy issues. He's now confronting the hard ones, and the hard ones um, have to do with, first of all, what to do with the Guantanamo prisoners. He's confronting that now. But secondly, what to do with those who have tortured. And uh, this is by no means an easy issue. I wish it was easy. It was, it was simply a matter of issuing an order and arresting the cabinet, uh, the Bush administration cabinet, which many people would like. Uh, the fact is there's very little support for that. And uh, President Obama, who's rather ambitious, uh, ambitious young president, new president, uh, knows that this would be a very difficult thing for him to do. The question is to come up with a solution that educates the American people that destroys the pernicious idea put forward by uh, former Pres Vice President Cheney and others that this was necessary to protect the country and that not doing it leaves the country vulnerable. Uh, and to, at the end of the day, bring the, the country back to a moral plane of observing uh, the laws of war. And I think this can be accomplished. I think it's very hard. I think it will involve both a commission, public disclosure, and probably prosecutions of some kind. Um, but all those things, it seems to me, have to work together. Uh, and this isn't over yet, you know. Um, it's, it's going to evolve, and you're going to have more public disclosures, uh, more discussion about this, and it, it's not pleasant. It's not a pleasant subject, but the fact is that the damage has, has already been incurred. It's already happened, and the question is, how do we uh, heal that damage? How do we heal those wounds? Um, and I hope this administration and this president um, can help do that. I think we're in a situation where we have no choice but to go forward and try to heal. 
Mark, on that note, I want to thank you for coming on our program, discussing these issues, and thank you for the important contribution uh, to this dialogue, uh, which America will have to have, and, and what you've written will, will be an important aid in making that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. It's good to be here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.